grateful I am for Kyle and Krista Small. Amen? Amen. They're blessings to all of us, and I'm also thankful in their absence, I'll say, of the Snodgrass family and, and Brother James, who's not feeling well today, and all those who help lead us in, in worship on Sunday morning. Uh, there, in many churches, uh, is many a worship war. Uh, over the best type of music and the most favorite songs and what instruments should be sung and who should be doing the singing. And I am, I am so pleased that in my 13 years, going on 13 years at this church, that has never happened once because we've maintained our focus not on the songs themselves, but to whom we're singing, which is to our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And so we're thankful that we keep the attention off of the performance and on the person of Christ. First Peter chapter 5, verse 1. And before I read it, let me say this is a difficult sermon for me to preach in the same way that it's difficult to preach on tithing, and that is because it's a text I would rather not handle, but it's in front of me anyway, so that's what I have to preach this morning. The Apostle Peter writes, So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the suffering of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you. Not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, when you are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Let's pray together. Now, Father, your people gather out of the world on this uh, snowy Sunday morning. And we do so because we believe that we are a part of your covenant of grace. We have, Lord, we hope and pray been saved by the blood of Jesus. And we recognize that Jesus Christ is not only the Lord of our life, but the God and King over all creation. Father, I pray that you would bless the preaching of your word. We gather around it this morning because we are convinced that it is the means that you use to disciple, to chasten, and to equip your followers, your believers. I pray that you would do that now in a supernatural way, that you would bless the preaching of your word, that we would understand its meaning, and that you would do things that the, the words of a mere mortal man cannot do. We confess to you as the Fellowship Baptist Church in Sydney, Montana, that we are committed to the Scripture's inerrancy, a belief in its sufficiency, its authority, and its inspiration. That being the case, Father, I pray that you would bless its preaching and bless its hearing. And we ask that you would move today among us in the name, above all names, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, he begins here by saying, I exhort the elders among you. And so he is turning his focus from the congregations to whom he is writing to those who are leading the congregation who are elders. And we'll get into that term in just a moment. But I want to recap, and it's all the more important I do it this morning than usual, a summary of what we've learned thus far in the book of First Peter and its overall purpose. The purpose of 1 Peter is to encourage a church during a troublesome time. And I began this sermon series at the very beginning of the great coronavirus panic of 2020. I thought maybe we could hear this. Uh, maybe we should hear this. And this might be an encouragement to us. When a church is in a difficult age, in a difficult stage, and things are not going well, what kind of, an, of encouragement can the Bible give us so that we might persevere through the middle of it? Because as hard times come to our nation, to our culture, to our community, it is not enough for me because it is not enough for God that I merely survive in the middle of hardship. That's not good enough. I want to thrive in the middle of hardship. That just because the rest of the world is having a terrible time doesn't mean that I have to. 
And just because the rest of the world is having difficulties, it doesn't mean that I'm subject to that because my God is the one who runs this world. And if he wants me to be safe and prosperous in the middle of danger and difficulty, then my God can certainly choose to do that. And so the instructions that we find in the book of 1 Peter are important for us as a church so that we remain faithful so that even if Jesus returns and there is no longer any faith anywhere left on the entire earth, he will find some at least remaining here among us that we will be the last ones standing. And that's not hubris on the part of the, the, the pastor of the Fellowship Baptist Church in Sydney. Every local congregation should have the exact same prayer. Every local congregation should have the attitude as they go into worship. If the rest of the world falls away from the truth of God, we will remain standing even if we are alone. And that's what the book of 1 Peter is about. And so now with that in view, what the point of 1 Peter is, so that we remain strong in the face of adversity, he gets to a very important point. And that very important point is directed towards the elders of the church. That is the leader of the church. Now before I go further, I want to explain what this term elders means. Uh, it's where we get the word presbyteros or uh, uh, presbyters. If you've heard of the, and I'm sure you all have, the Presbyterian uh, church. I don't mean to patronize, of course you have. But that comes from the Greek word presbyteros, and it means uh, one who is older, although in the, in the context of the church, it's not just about age. It is about age. But it's not just about physical age, but it's about the length of time that someone has proven themselves as being faithful within the Lord. In some traditions, including our own, we don't do it much here at this church, but there's no reason we couldn't. People will refer to the day that they were born again as their second birthday when they were born again. And they'll say, I, this, is, this is my second birthday. In other words, what they're saying is, I was converted on this day back then, and in Christ, I'm 13 years old, or 30 years old, or, or 40 years old. It's a, it's a, it's a tradition that's, that's neither right nor wrong. The concept of elder here is one who has been given spiritual authority on account of their years of faithfulness to God. It is about one who is expected to lead the church and and he says so I exhort and this is a word of emphasis like it, it's not just a uh, it's not just an offering of advice it's it's a it's a bit of a command mixed with encouragement I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the suffering of Christ. Let me stop there. So Peter's identifying himself with the elders of the church. He's saying, I'm also an elder, and I'm exhorting you as a fellow elder. But then Peter goes on, and he, he exhorts them in a fashion that they cannot duplicate, most of them. He says, a witness of the sufferings of the Lord Jesus Christ. As an apostle, even more so than an elder, he was an eyewitness to the crucified Christ and the resurrected one. And that was one of the prerequisites for serving as an apostle. And so when he says, as a witness of the sufferings of Christ, he's actually saying, I exhort you as an elder and as an apostle. He says, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. And he gives them a bit of optimistic hope to look forward to. He's saying, listen, we have some things to look forward to. And by the way, uh, in a crisis, in a cultural crisis and in bad times, we all need to be reminded that better times are indeed coming. One way or another, it will not always be this way. This world might get worse, but one day... Well, we have a one-way ticket out of here to a place that is not bad, but a place that is good. And then he gives his advice, which I want to center on this morning. He says, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you. Let me stop there for a moment. So his advice begins as, as thus, 
shepherd, and he's not using that word as a noun. He's using that word as a verb. It's something that you do. He says, shepherd the flock of God that is among you. He wants the the pastors and elders there to shepherd, to take care of, to serve, to love, to support those people who are within the congregation. And he tells them to exercise oversight. But it's there that I need to stop and explain what, what that word means in the original tongue. The word oversight is where we get the word episcopo, or the root is episkopos. You might have heard of the Episcopalian Church. That's where that term comes from. An episcopos, an episcopo, that is one who has oversight and is directing the affairs of the church. So we find out a few things about the elder. Not only does an elder shepherd the church, think of one who is caring for the sheep, but he is also one who is directing and managing the affairs of the church. Now notice, these two things are not a lot alike. A shepherd is a bit of a nanny to some extent because he's picking up the lambs, he's caring for the lambs, he's bottle feeding the lambs, he's supporting, he's, he's loving them in that sort of way. But an episkopos, as the word is used here, has oversight and he is directing. So he is not merely a servant, the elder is also a leader. By the way, this term episkopos also denotes organization and and. Um, direction within the church. In other words, it's, it's not anarchy. It's, it's, it's not loosely affiliated. There is an organizational structure. That's the word I was looking for. A structure to the church that Christ has established. Now, Christ has given to the church elders and pastors. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 tells us something that Ephesians 2 also tells us, that Christ Jesus gave unto the church prophets, missionaries, apostles, pastors, and teachers to the church. And that their purpose is to edify the body of Christ. And so the episkopos, which is an office, means that there is structure and organization within the church, and an office holder in the church. Now, for those of you who are blessed enough to not pay attention to what's going on in the world religiously, thank God for that ability. I don't have it. And so you may think that this is a relatively a non-issue, but I want to assure you there is a growing movement in evangelical Christianity that diminishes the need for the office of the pastorate. It is the home church movement that is making exiles out of the church into homes. But here's the problem with the home church movement. And it's one. It's singular. The problem is, more times than not, it does not qualify as a church. It only qualifies as a home. Let me be, let me be clear. A church can meet in a home. A church isn't a church because it meets in a particular place made of brick and mortar or sticks and stones. It can meet in a house. It can meet in a, in a church. I I've preached uh, several times at Wolf Creek Baptist Church, which meets uh, effectively in a bar on Sunday morning. There's not a lot of places to meet there. So it can meet uh, relatively anywhere, so to speak. But the church must have the structure that Jesus Christ himself has given it. So when someone says, you know, I like Christianity, I suppose, uh, and usually the statement is prefaced with the expression, you've heard it, I'm sure. I'm not religious, I'm spiritual. You've heard it before, right? I like to say, I'm not spiritual, I'm religious, and turn that around. Uh, The scripture does not speak of religion as a negative thing, but as a positive thing. For example, the book of James says that true religion is caring for orphans and widows and the poor. In that respect, I am religious. Mark it down, all right? We have a religion, and it's the one of Christ. But The issue uh, for many people is that they would say, I'm just not into 
organized religion. I like spirituality. I don't like organized religion. At which point, we just need to say, then you're not a fan of Christianity because that religion was organized by Christ. And he organized it with elders and deacons in every congregation. He organized it with doctrine and policies given to us in the scripture, with standards that is called biblical discipline. He's organized it in every conceivable way. By the way, what is the alternative to organized religion? Disorganized religion? I'm pretty sure God's not a fan of that because the scripture tells us that God is not a God of disorder, but God is a God of order. And there's a movement to drag the church away from its organization. Sometimes it is also said, I don't like the established church or the establishment. Again, I don't like anything that has been improperly established, but I want exactly what Christ Jesus has established. There's a principle for that, or rather I should say a reason. There's a reason why we're seeing a move of Christians away from organized religion and into their own home, for many people, cult. There's a reason for that. Twofold. Number one, they are tired of reading the scripture like an adult and coming to church and being taught the scripture as though they were a child. Part of it is the patronizing, sophomoric, juvenile, children's church put on for adults in many congregations where they act as though you have a third grade reading level and can't understand anything about the scripture so they need to use visual aids, talk slowly, and leave their speeches to 10 minutes. And by the way, if you were catechized in some of those churches, that's probably about as much as you can handle. But there's a second reason. The second reason is not as generous. And that is because there is a general principle at play. Jesus mentioned this principle in Matthew chapter 26, verse 31, in which he told the disciples, You will fall away from me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Beloved, when the church is under persecution, when it is being mistreated and maligned, when it becomes unpopular to be a Christian, When your views become dangerous to the world, possibly even criminal, when it starts getting real in this world for Christians, as we gradually get closer to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, that is no point in time to go without biblical leadership in your life. That is not the time to scatter sheep or to remove the shepherd in a time of hardship for the church. That is when leadership is needed more than ever, right then. There are times when, as a pastor, I have to give very little direction at all. Everything is good. There is no problem. Everyone knows their role. Everything is going along swimmingly. The the same thing goes for my household, where it just goes. There's no issues or problems. But when there's a bump in the night, that is the time when you want a leader in the home. Amen? That's the time when you need strong leadership. And he is encouraging the church, do not flee from the pastor. Do not run from the leadership. Do not Do not forsake your duty to be a pastor and a leader in the midst of those hard times. It's more important than ever to show leadership to the flock of God in the midst of difficulty. I saw a website article just this morning, just this morning, before I got out of bed, of a home church gathering starting around the country, and the line said by the author and the organizer of the home church was, as Jesus returns, the church will need to go underground. We will begin to we'll need to meet in our homes, away from any type of organizational structure. And I thought that is precisely the opposite of what the Word of God teaches. The Scripture says, "Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together." And it's all the more important as that day of Christ's return draws nigh. Why would I go underground when the scripture tells me not to hide my light under a bushel? If you think that making Christianity illegal will make our church go underground, you got another thing coming. Give me a ladder. I'm getting higher, not lower. 
The church of God shines in the midst of difficulty. It does not hide in the midst of difficulty. And if there ever comes a day where it is illegal or criminal to worship the Lord Jesus Christ, then may our blood reap some martyrs because it's going to spill. There's no other way around it because Christ is worthy of it. But that's going to take some degree of leadership. And so he says, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight. And this, this needs some explanation. Not under compulsion, it says, but willingly. And honestly, I've, I've thought for uh, many years, what does that mean? Not under compulsion. And so I had to do a little bit of word study this week. The term compulsion is anakastos, and it means forcefully, but let me give the context here from the commentary, which says this, and I, I pray that you're given ears to hear this and understand it. What does it mean the pastor should not leave under compulsion? Because the first thing that I think of is the pastor should not be harsh, the pastor should not be heavy-handed. By the way, there is truth to that. That the pastor should not be harsh and the pastor should not be heavy-handed. It's also true that if a man or a woman is a leader, rarely do they need to remind people of it. Let me say that again. If a man or a woman is a leader, rarely do they have to remind people of it. People already know it. The person who has to go around flaunting the leadership card is probably a poor one. People naturally follow leaders if they trust them. Here's what the commentary says. Why should this exhortation be given so prominently? It's hardly to be thought that St. Peter had in his view the humility which led men to adopt such strange methods of avoiding the responsibility of the priesthood as we find resorted to by Chrysostom and Ambrose. More, much more probably, he is thinking of the actual danger to life and property of being, quote, ringleaders of the sect. And he cites Acts chapter 24, verse 5 which would lead cowardly bishops to throw up their office. He's not treating of the motives which should lead a man to accept the position. He speaks, he speaks to persons who already hold the office and urges them not to leave the flock. Let me stop there just for a moment. What he's saying is not that you shouldn't pastor by compelling people and forcing them to do things, although that's true. He's speaking of the compulsion that one might feel to remain a pastor. That when times are tough, the first thing the pastor has, is prone to do or that he would like to do is to say, I'm not paid enough for this, and to split, to leave, to run. And someone might compel them and force them to remain where they're at. They might be they might have their arm twisted. Hey, you have a job to do. That's what he's referring to here. He says this, he says, he speaks to persons who already hold the office and urges them not to leave the flock like hirelings when they see the persecution coming on. Several of the best authorities add, quote, but willingly, according to God. It was God, that is, who put them in that station, and they must not need the compulsion of their church members or their laity or the rest of the episcopate or the apostles to keep them in the post. Let me explain that and put that into modern English. So hard times come upon the church in this hypothetical situation. Well, it's not hypothetical. It's very real in the scripture, and it's quite real now. The person who's most likely to get shot, persecuted, hung, crucified is going to be the pastor. He's the one that gets most of the criticism. Most of the derision is directed towards him. In Los Angeles, California, in Sun Valley, they're a suburb of Los Angeles, you have 7,000 or so people meeting this morning for worship. They've been meeting for worship for some time. You don't hear about those 7,000 people meeting for worship. You hear about Dr. MacArthur, don't you? He's the one that gets hauled into court. It's him who's going to be castigated in the newspapers for simply gathering on Sunday morning because the health, of, health board tells him not to. He's going to be the one and has been the one to take most of the criticism. And so in the middle of difficulties, just to give an example, the pastor might be inclined to say, uh, I'm out of here. But the scripture says, Jesus, as a matter of fact, that what makes a hireling a hireling is that when the wolf comes, he runs. A shepherd is the one who beats back wolves. 
A shepherd says, these are my sheep. A shepherd says, even if they don't belong to him, for now they're my sheep. I'm caring for them. I'm their steward. And I will die. I will fight lion. I will fight bear. I will fight wolf. You get to the sheep over my dead body. Bring it on. And any good shepherd like young David, in a few years' time, by the time he's a teenager, has killed these animals, these predators, with nothing but his staff. Shepherds are not pansies, I tell you that. Shepherds are strong, brave, masculine men. The hireling, though, the one who doesn't really care for the sheep, the one who took it just because it was a gig, it was a job of some kind, he took it only for the paycheck. He's not related to the owner. He's not his son. He doesn't care for the sheep. It's not his inheritance. That hireling will flee the moment that a wolf comes. He says, I'm being paid, but I'm not being paid enough for this. That man is a hireling. And so, in order to keep the, the clergy in his position, in his, in his job, what the commentary writer is saying is that he might be pressured by the laity, that is the church members, or he could be pressured by the episcopate, that would be his fellow elders, or it could be the, presby the, the, uh, the, the presbytery, again, his fellow elders, at least in our what I hope to be biblical tradition. But rather than being compelled to do your job, a biblical pastor is one that says, I honestly can't help but do my job. I, I can't help but do it. And so the good pastor in the midst of difficulty is not one that you have to pay or bribe to stay at his post. He's one that you can't beat out of his post with a stick. He's not going anywhere. He's not going anywhere. And that's what it's speaking of here. He says, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you. And he says, as God would have you. Which reminds me of yet another verse. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. And this is why I said... I don't necessarily prefer to, this, prefer to preach this text any more than I do tithing because it comes across as self-serving. But again, I've come across the text. I've got to preach the full counsel of God's word. Obey your leaders and submit to them for their keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. You know, a lot of times, I'm busy telling husbands, listen to your wives. There's a bit of confusion that just because as Christians we believe that the husband should lead the home, that does not mean that he doesn't listen to the wife that God gave him for the purpose of helping him. The wife is the help meet, the scripture says. She is there as his most prized and treasured counselor. No one's opinion should mean more to him than his wife's. He's to listen, and he is to take into consideration. And even though he has the final say, because somebody has to, and we either have to decide this going into the marriage, or we can just divorce about it a few years later when we can't agree. We can pick one. Even though that's the case, there should still be listening, respecting, and obeying. The obeying that's happening here in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17, is from parishioner to pastor. But as I've often clarified in the past, this doesn't mean that the pastor is entitled to come and tell you how to live your life. It's none of my business what time your kids go to bed, it's none of my business what kind of shoes you wear, what kind of car you drive. And the last thing I want to do is get into your personal business. On occasion, I'll have to. If you're being riotously, or riot, riot, uh, riotously sinful, I'll have to intervene and tell you shame on you. That's what church discipline is for. 
But in terms of the details of your life, I don't care. And I'll tell you right now, I've made that mistake in the past where feeling pressured to intervene in people's lives, where frankly it was none of my business to intervene in people's lives. I don't want to make that same mistake again. I want you to live your life. I want to be able to lead you by example. But there are times, frequently, when I have to approach someone and say, this thing you're thinking about doing is dumb. Don't do that thing. That's a bad idea. And I can't necessarily chapter and verse it. I'm just on the outside looking in saying this is a bad idea. And I'm going to be honest, I've been wrong sometimes. But I would say nine times out of ten, that whole story ends with them coming saying, I should have listened to you. Well, you know what? Just like God gives you a wife to listen to men, and boys and girls, just like God has given you parents to listen to, God has given you a pastor to listen to. God has given you shepherds to listen to. It does them no good to give you bad advice. They have every incentive under the sun to give you good advice. So listen to them. Don't discount their opinions. And here's the thing. Even if you can't necessarily take their advice, would you please listen to it and take it into consideration? That's what pastors are for. That's why they're around. That's why God gave them to you. And before you make life-changing decisions, please consult your spiritual elders. Make it easy on you and them in the end. Listen to that advice. And it says, listen, pastors uh, should not, again, verse 2, part B, should not be sh uh, in it for shameful gain, but eagerly. Meaning that we're not here. I believe the King James says filthy lucre. In other words, uh, pastors should not be in it for the money. I don't know what is a worse example of a pastor besides one that consistently has affairs or has any affair. That happens quite a bit, and God forbid them, and may they be handed to the devil for it. But something else that makes us look terribly bad is when the pastor is pulling in six figures and maybe seven figures. You know, Joyce Meyer has a $7,000 gold toilet. I kid you not. It's in congressional testimony. And as much as a gold toilet might in some way appeal to me in my weird sense of humor, it's perverse when you drop $7,000 for a gold toilet. That makes us all look bad. Paul said, woe unto me if I do not preach the gospel. In other words, there was a part of him his belly, so to speak, was on fire. And he had to get it out. He had to preach. He didn't, not only did he not do it for the money, you couldn't have stopped him. You couldn't have paid him not to preach. And that's the way any good preacher, that's the way that any good pastor ought to be. You know, you don't pay your pastor to do ministry. You pay him so that he can do ministry. Do you understand the difference? You're not compensating him for what he does. It's not compensation. My compensation, this passage says, is an unfading crown of glory. I don't need your chump change. You're not compensating a pastor. You're allowing them to spend time to minister. There's a difference. He says... Not domineering over those in your charge, but examples to the flock. Not beating the flock. Not browbeating them. Being kind so much as possible. Blunt but kind. Now, I don't mean any disrespect whatsoever to other pastors who came before me. As a matter of fact, I owe a great deal of gratitude to uh, to. Pastor LaHaye and Pastor Ackerman, uh, Pastor Brannon, 
and whoever else I've forgotten in the 40-year history of this church. But when I came here, that front parking spot, and you can still see it a little bit if you squint, uh, has yellow across of, it, across of it, and pastor is written on the front, right by the front door. It says pastor. It's about faded where you can't see it anymore, but it's there. If you notice, I've never parked there. I figured the pastor ought to lead by example, so I park in the back, not right there in the front when the service is gathering. And I took my pocket knife as my first official act uh, as pastor of this church, my first act, and I chiseled the word reverend off the door because I'm not to be revered. Jesus is. I don't take the title and don't want it. And I always make a habit at Summit, if you've not noticed, of being the last to eat. Never the first. That one's a little bit selfish because I'm convinced that when the scripture says the first shall be last and the last shall be first, I'm cutting in line in heaven and y'all are going to have to get in the back. I'm just long gaming that one. But the pastor ideally should lead by example. I pray that I'm a pastor that you can follow by leading by example. That's my prayer, and if not, I hope to become a better one so that it can be monkey see, monkey do. You follow what you see. Commitment. Courage. Sacrifice. Diligence. I pray that you know that Pastor Hall will never bend the knee to Baal or worship anyone besides Jesus Christ. I pray you know that in your heart. But the reason I pray you know that is so that you know that if it ever comes to it, I'll not be alone, but you'll stand with me. So that in the end, God's elect his remnant will have nothing to be ashamed of. And that one day, when we open our eyes in glory, our Savior, who we have sung about and preached about and told people about but never seen, will see. And he'll look at us and say, Well done, good and faithful servant, as opposed to depart from me. I never knew you. Might we live our lives in such a way that we know that our Savior will say, well done. You know, there's not a day that goes by that I don't wonder if my dad is proud of me. Everything I do, I'm 39 years old, everything I do, I wonder if my dad be proud of me. And he never says it. We ought to live our lives in that way in respect to God. Everything we do, we should think to ourselves, does this glorify our maker? Is this what he would have us to do? Because we should want our celestial father to be proud of us in what we do. Verse 4 when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. You know, I heard one time the pastorate called the glorious burden. Because the job is certainly glorious, uh, but it's also a burden. It's a bit of an honor to be able to stand in front of people and to talk and have them sit and listen. Most people don't get to experience that. And I usually get a card or two for Pastor Appreciation Month, which is nice, and sometimes a, a Christmas gift. That's nice. I suppose there's some honor in that. Now, the days of pastors being honored in the community are pretty much long gone. That was something that our grandparents experienced that, that we don't now. Now we're treated like used car salesmen for the most part. Not a lot of glory in it. And it is surely a burden as well. There's a lot of burden with it. Only in the last year have I finally been able to uh, turn my phone off at night or put it on silent. For about a decade, I just could never find my 
courage to do it because I'd be afraid that one of y'all would get sick in the middle of the night or die or kill yourself or get killed or have a car accident or something tragic. And that lives with you 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all week long, every week of your life. That Spurgeon one time said that of Jesus, they, and I'm not quite sure what exactly he was looking at to say it, but he was Spurgeon, so I'm sure he had a reason that they, they thought Jesus was 50 years of age when he was only 30, and Spurgeon's point is that a pastor will usually look well beyond his years, because this is a job that will stress you out, and I'm stressed out terribly. But I'm going to get an unfading crown of glory. And the scripture doesn't say here, but it tells us in the book of Revelation what we will do with that crown. And it says that we shall cast them at the feet of our Savior. It's not for us to wear. It's for us to give to him. That even in heaven there is only room for one king, and his name is Jesus Christ. He gets the crown. Now, I was explaining to a former church member this week, I'd say his name, but it's not my business to share. He moved away. I was thinking about becoming a pastor. And I explained to him, it's not the church that calls you as a pastor. Now, I know the church has a vote to call somebody as a pastor. It's not the church that calls someone as a pastor. It's God who calls someone as a pastor. And the church votes to see if they recognize that calling or not. Because the scripture says to us, again, I got distracted earlier, Hebrews 13, 17, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they're keeping watch over your souls, as those who will have to give an account. And then here was my point. Boy, did I get distracted. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. And the scripture goes on to say that it is God himself, the Holy Spirit, who has made us an overseer of the church. Who makes the pastor the pastor? The Holy Spirit is the one who makes us an overseer. He appoints. He removes. And if it's God who gives you that function, you best do a good job at it. And if that's not you, you'd best respect that. I would encourage you in this as well, and that is, no matter, I mean, I could drop dead tomorrow and you'd have a different pastor. So it's not just about me, it's about anybody. When it comes to the men of God that bring the word of God to your family every week, if you have something negative to say about him, don't say it in front of your children. They need to look at the pastor as a position, one of honor. If not for the man, at least for the office that is held, not of reverence per se, but certainly of respect. And in verse 5, he says, Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Listen to them. Why? Because they've been around of the block a time or two that you haven't. You don't know everything. And then he says, Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another for God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble okay so first he says I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder all right so he's speaking to elders then notice how he just got done saying likewise likewise young men so he's turning his attention from pastors to young men and he's like you need especially you need to listen to your elders And then he turns his attention to everyone, and he says, let us all clothe ourselves in humility, because God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. You know what that one means? Uh, 
that means we all need to get along on the grounds that we recognize no one is perfect and we should all be humbled before God. Pastor, deacon, layperson, newcomer, church attendee, Sunday school superintendent, I don't care what function you have. If you're in the family of God, clothe yourselves with humility, just like you would in your own house. Here's why. When other people come to your house, you want it to look nice, you've got a good, you know, you, it, it's, uh, it's presentable to the public, and you got a way of presenting yourself to the public in which you look pretty good. You might have everyone fooled except for the people in your family. Here's why. They've all seen you naked. That's why. They've all had to walk into the bathroom after you just got done using it. They smell your morning breath. They're the ones that have to wash your dirty underwear. The reason you're humble with your family and you don't act like you're all that and a bag of chips, as the kids say these days, is because you are at your worst in front of them and they know that whatever facade you've put up to the world is really not the real you. The real you wakes up at 5 a.m. in the morning with your makeup undone and your hair uncombed and, and your breath smelling like it could slay dragons, okay? Well, the reason why we treat one another with humility, we're not all a bunch of self-righteous hypocrites. They're going to be mean to each other when we find each other in error. The reason why we're forgiving and we love is because, well, that's, that's us here. I mean, short of the morning breath and bathroom experience, I mean, that aside, we see each other at each other's worst because there's one thing in common that each and every single one of you have with me when you step into those doors this morning. Here's what we all had in common. Each and every one of us is a wretched sinner desperately needing Jesus' grace and mercy. That's what we have in common, our wretchedness. In other words, like not in a literal sense, but spiritually we see each other naked. Spiritually. We understand how imperfect we are. Because James says when you sin, confess your sins one to another, and we will happily confess those sins that we might be forgiven of those sins so that we might be given grace. But that acknowledges that we are indeed sinners. And so we clothe ourselves with humility. And I heard a brother in Florida, my, my brother Edgar, uh, say a line that really impressed me this week uh, over dinner. And he said, at our church, we f this was his expression, we fight hard for our unity. Think about that expression. We fight hard for our unity. You know what that means? That means we will wrestle and scrap with each other in order to maintain unity. That make a lot of sense, does it? Seems kind of counterintuitive, but if you've been in church more than for a few years, you know exactly what I mean, don't you? We're going to fight hard so that when we come to church next Sunday, we may have our differences, but we also have the thing that ties us together that cannot be broken, and that's the blood of Christ. So that being said, to tie it back to the original purpose and meaning for this epistle, 1 Peter. When we go into difficult times, we should aim to listen and to, as much as possible, obey our elders. At the same time, we recognize that no one is perfect, including our elder, including our pastor, including the person sitting next to one another. And we will struggle together to maintain our humility and love. Because I've discovered this over the years. We can handle, me personally, let me just say me personally, I can handle anything the world throws at me, or at least I've been able to thus far. And usually with a great deal of fun and mockery involved in it. I don't fear the world at all. But when there's difficulty and disunity within the church, it breaks me. And I don't want to have anything to do with it. And so as we go into a world where we will very much see a polarization between the people of God and the people who are not of God, and there might even be bloodshed on account of it in the future, 
we must realize that the church and the people of God is a place where we feel safe, a place where we feel loved, and a place we are unified, and a place, most importantly, where we know that we are at home. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for giving us this passage, inerrant and inspired and sufficient and authoritative, and I pray that all four of those things would take root in our heart. Bless you for these people, Father. And I pray that you might lead us to a biblical model of ecclesiology, of church, that we might use it to magnify and glorify you. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to have the uh, deacons.